Well, first of all, thank you so much, Agnes, uh, for such a wonderful talk to really share with us the deeper insights of our cultural perspective. Tomorrow, Paris uh, life cycle. This is beyond. This is before we recruit them. We need to know who they are, where they're coming from. Tomorrow, Agnes' word, learn, in Chinese is learning while questioning. But they do not ask questions. They verbally, they ask questions silently. Don't consider those students who are not saying anything as those who are not thinking of it. Actually, they are thinking more actively while keeping silent. And that is my topic today, silence. And I also understand this is also you, I'm the hurdle between silence and lunch. <laughs> so I need to keep my own time to make sure you are ready for lunch as soon as the time is up. So Agnes, if you can do me a favor, show me when, but I will be very, very conscious about keeping my time. I, I realize there's some problem with the computer, and I cannot move that. Okay, so I uh, was interested in this topic uh, a long, long time ago. Actually, I did my dissertation about 15 or maybe 20 years ago. No, no. Okay, yeah. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, I realized that lots of students from Asia, they're usually very quiet in the classroom. So I did my dissertation. I really focused on four subgroups. Chinese, Korean, Indonesia, and Japanese. To see why is it that when they are compared with American students, they tend to be very quiet, and yet they perform so well, they get even higher grades than their American counterparts. This is something that is worth exploring. So I started that work about 20 years ago, and still now I'm still observing it. But of course, we have different generations of Chinese students. They might not be perceived as that quiet, and they could be very vocal, very uh, active when they are with people who they feel comfortable with. Okay. So these are the phenomena. Are we able to do that now? Yeah. It's not synchronized? Okay. Does that mean I need to talk without power? <laughs> This is good. Okay. So, uh, as you know, that uh, one of the phenomena is that among uh, um, all the international students, Chinese students are one third at Stony Brook University. Half of international students are Chinese. So this is a phenomenon. Just well, they're just move, not moving anymore. <laughs> but anyway, I would. Uh, can you see the change? Keep talking, <laughs> and you keep silent. <laughs> As if it's moving, okay? Uh, I think in my talk I will focus on two issues. I want to uh, want you to have some kind of understanding of Chinese students' silence in American classrooms, and also what can we do to help break Chinese students' break silence.
Yes.
U.S. faculty professors are used to teach. They try to uh, process information very, very quickly and we expect students spontaneously to react to what they say. But actually, the styles, given what we learn about Chinese students, mainly they focus on absorbing knowledge. They listen attentively to teachers because they impart knowledge and they are supposed to learn. So the style, teaching style difference causes students to be more quiet. Participation as a course requirement. If some professors make participation at 10% of their course requirement, their students will seek opportunities to gain those 10%. And that is a very important thing. I myself tried, and I found many silent people are so outspoken, <laughs> almost simultaneously. But I, when I give them 10 questions, they only focus on two questions they want to speak on, about, but not the other questions. So they select me to gain the point. Opportunities to speak up. But sometimes professors just concentrate on teaching or talking about something without giving opportunities for students to speak up, without giving them way time to process the information, and without uh, disallowing those most outspoken peers, students, to stop talking, so then others to speak. So usually you find in the classroom, there are always a few students who are most verbal, and as professor need to readjust, rather than say, okay, I know what you want to say, I want to hear other opinions. Or you walk around and encourage some people, are you ready to talk about this? The fourth is affect. Affective factors are also very important. They have anxiety. They feel that English is not their first language. And they don't feel they can speak the same rate, same fashion as American peers. So they have anxiety. Their heart beat quickly and they, they turn their face turn red. Motivation. Whether speaking up in the classroom will contribute or help them actually learn. And some of them might not believe in that. And risk taking. So risk taking is another fact. Are they ready to take the risk? Are they, are they afraid of making some mistakes? Are they afraid of losing face? And sociocultural factors. It's a value to believe in the role of the teacher and student. Just like Agnes said. The value is to respect teachers. They do not want to confront challenging teachers. Even though they have, they have questions, they might wait until class is over and then stand in a line to ask the higher teacher. And that teacher does not have time. He has to rush to another classroom, and that break has to the communication. Face work, showing respect for others by keeping silent. And sometimes if you have a quality question, if you feel no one can answer you, you are also challenging people, make others lose face. So they have to consider whether there's something, when I ask you, you are able to answer. A norm of being a good listener is always considered uh, favorable in Chinese context as a good student. And finally, but also uh, most important, is linguistic factors. If you know how English is learned in China, you will understand why these students face difficulties. We have IEC, we have ESL program, we have academic writing programs, and we give them so many courses, but these learners when they learn English, they learn English for tests, for GIE, for TOEFL, for IELTS. They are learning to get good scores. There is hardly any room for communication. It, they are not to blame. Why? Because some language classes are more than 100 students. And the teacher cannot afford to allow them to discuss issues. Otherwise, it's going to be a tea house. You cannot control them. <laughs> so the teachers have their responsibility to impart knowledge, let them memorize, let them learn pattern drills, let them learn some good essays. And this is their primary responsibility. Of course, when the quality change, or when, when the situation change, so some international schools, some high schools have smaller classes, they reduce the number. Of course, that takes resources, not necessarily happening in public schools. Usually, at least when you teach college English, 150 students. In, in New Orleans School, where they prepare students for like GIE or TOEFL, you have 600 students. Every 10 line, there is a TV monitor. Okay, they said from here to Hilton Nam Ni. <laughs> so all the students are lined up because that is uh, their facility. And students are looking at the screen. How can they ask questions? There's hundreds of people in the classroom. So that is the reality. And uh, of course, uh, lack of communicative competence. 
So learning English to pass test, that is the norm. So you will encounter students who are not able to write well, who might not be able to speak well, but they are very good in vocabulary, in grammar rules, and in passive learning skills. Uh, they do not have so, uh, sociocultural, uh, uh, sociocultural skills, so we have pragmatic skills and linguistic, uh, linguistic competence, pragmatic competence, sociocultural competence, and also strategic competence. In strategic competence, silence is one of them. They are, they are competent, but they are silent. And of course, uh, sometimes they have accents, they are afraid of uh, strange pronunciation to be laughed at when, when they pronounce some, some words. So these are the five areas, but I would look at these five domains in three different levels, three different levels. One is more positive, facilitated. So if they can take advantage of their knowledge, if they are motivated to speak up, if they are confident in their own language uh, abilities, and if they can communicate with teachers without over concerning about face-saving strategies, and if they are able to uh, contribute and I think that will become very positive. Some students belong to that category. On the contrary, some students, if they hit the bottom, they will become very quiet and passive. And some students will, depending on the situation, whether there's something they are good at, whether there's something they can speak about, they are going to change their goals in participation, varying from course to course uh, with different instructors. So to me, uh, there are actually two main interpretations out of this pattern. One is the cultural background, one is the educational background. I feel these two contribute to student silence in the classroom, mostly. So cultural background. And we know that I don't want to either to use the uh, to just, uh, describe Chinese culture as collectivist culture or American individualistic, but at least Overall, you will see the influence of collectivism, collectivism on Chinese students' behavior. For instance, uh, difference to group harmony, forms their own groups, stay within the group, and uh, so this is the, the chart. You can see the difference. And the cultural background, background. Secondly, face work. So. Lots of sociolinguists discuss about the face work. Here are three meanings. Giving face, not pointing out others' mistake, is giving others face. Or you do not challenge people, is to give others face. Otherwise, if people cannot, uh, if, if people are not ready or cannot answer your question, you cause them to lose face. This is something you don't want to see happen. Secondly, losing face. Expressing ideas in front of a lot of people might cause them losing face. Sometimes your ideas might not be understood. You, if you speak up in the class, your classmates might not consider what you say is valuable. You will feel you lose face. You don't want to see that happen. The third is saving face. Why don't we stay quiet so no one knows what I can say, what I can think about, and at the same time, I can benefit. So these are the three levels of face work, and sometimes it happens to individuals on different occasions. Sirens inherited from education in China. And uh, looking at those two diagrams, you know that uh, uh, how they moving? Okay. over reliance on teachers. Dominant lecture style, sometimes it will cause people to be passive learners or listen only. Show respect to teachers. Knowledge versus ability. Knowledge is more important, and ability is something you can self develop in the end um, on other occasions. And a learner versus user. That is something I want to talk about. So in China, we have a concept of learner, but in US, on the other hand, we have a concept of a user. So when you consider yourself as a learner, you will absorb knowledge, you will listen carefully. When you consider yourself as a user, you will practice, you will communicate, you will interact. And that changes the role of students when they learn English or other subject matter. 
So I want to say in UAS, we encourage students to communicate because we have smaller class, class size and students are able to do that. But in China, sometimes it restricts students to be, be more interactive. Silence inherited from education in China. Grades means everything, but not participation. Resistant when forced. The inference of class size, and look at that. <laughs> this is very typical. Silence inherited from the education in China. Know the officer too well to bother. Sometimes they don't bother. Oh, this is so easy. Why should I waste my time? <laughs> to avoid show off. Sometimes if you speak uh, to an officer, then you might consider that other in group members will consider you are showing off. When I returned to China many times, many years ago, I occasionally will use some English because I don't, I forgot how to express it in Chinese. And people like co my, my friends will consider me showing off. <laughs> and sometimes I speak Beijing dialect to my local uh, country fellows and uh, my uh, former classmates. They say, why don't you speak Beijing dialect to show off? You have to speak Suzhou dialect or, or local dialect to, to uh, establish your in-group membership, connecting. So sometimes when you have too many Chinese students together, this thing occur. They do not want to be considered by in-group members as someone who either show off or who lose, loses his or her face. When you have international students, diverse international uh, in the classroom, this will be reduced or eliminated. So sometimes they are not considering the instructor or other American or other students from other culture. They are more concerned about their in-group members, how they will be perceived if they act on this or that. And that is a phenomenon we need to pay attention to, uh, especially in engineering or STEM areas where we have so many Chinese students in the classroom. So this is the, you know, uh, another diagram to indicate the differences. So, I have some interpretations. I think uh, uh, interpret two main external factors. Those are the uh, internal factors, uh, external factors. One is uh, attitude and stereotypes. The Chinese student silence is aggravated by the attitudes and stereotypes imposed on them, and they are seen as passive learners. This sometimes uh, is shocking, and as you know, that uh, sometimes uh, you know if you consider their silence as something negative, and they will be very passively resistant to speak out. And they will why did you think me like that? I will show you how good I am by test, by examinations. I can show you. So they will build those kind of resistance. This may perpetuate the side side circle uh, of silence. Stereotypical view of Chinese students as passive learners. So this is again something we need to be cautious about. This may lead them to become more accepting of the lack of participation of Chinese students than from other students. It may also impact those students who are in the process of developing confidence to speak up in class. So encouraging is always important. <coughs> if they have a chance, they want to try, give them a chance, encourage them, then they build their confidence. And if you suffocate, if you stop them right away, what are you talking about? And they might stop altogether. <coughs> Teacher fact. Now, how can we deep into our silence? This is uh, what I try to think about. And as you know, first of all, we have to understand, as Agnes said, that 20, 30 years ago, we predominantly, as Kerry said, we have graduate students. I'm one of the graduate students 20, 30 years of Agnes or another. And we were so motivated because we went through hardship. It was not easy for us to go to the college, one out of 100 admission rate. And when we graduated, we worked so hard, hard to come. For me, an English major, a linguistic major, I have to study in English-speaking countries. So when I arrived in the United States, I realized how much time I had lost already because my classmates are much younger than I was at that time, <coughs> even though I did not feel like it. 
But now, we are facing new generation, younger and younger students in here. They might not be self-motivated because they are pushed by their parents. They drive Mercedes, uh, BMW, on campus, they want to eat in the best restaurant that they can. They're not that motivated, but also they're not that tired. So we have to understand the transition of this room. And sometimes, as Karen pointed out, I felt so uh, right that uh, many students, regardless who they are, what they can do, they always end up highly ranked universities. So coming to Stony Brook University is a prestige because we are one of the top uh, 100 universities. But some students are not ready. And so they will use agencies to help them prepare their scores, ask someone to write letters of recommendations, and try to beef up scores, whatever they can do, because their parents can afford to have those same services. So when they come here, they are not ready. Not only linguistically, but also cognitively. And they are not motivated. And that's why we have the first, uh, we call the first semester warning for many students, not only for us, uh, in our campus, but across the nation. And that is phenomenal. And that is why there is another business coming up to rescue, help those, what we call the second chance companies. And they target those students to help them go to community colleges and get high scores and come back again. Or they will return to China to, to apply for uh, higher, even better university than the next time. So I want to say all these are happening, and we need to realize that the silence we cannot uh, consider as a, as a uh, phenomenon of all Chinese students. We need to look at who we are dealing with. Less shy and silent, motivated to make changes, and try to seize every opportunity to excel at school. This is something I feel that they are passionate about, but they just don't know how. They need proper guidance. They need our services to guide them rather than help them do things. We'll show them what to do and how to do it. So I think at one point, say, if you provide too much services, they will be in doubt, they will be scaffolded to have an easier time. It's not fair to other students. But it is what services we can provide so that they can take their own initiatives to acculturate themselves in this uh, environment. So response to a study abroad for Chinese undergraduate students, and uh, uh, as you can see, that enhanced comprehensive professional competitiveness, immigration and working possibilities, learn from other cultures, experience of advanced education, and learn advanced knowledge and technology. These are the source of motivation for younger generations of Chinese younger generation. All right. Let me wrap up by a few uh, suggestions, interventions to help Chinese students break silence. First, I talk about teachers, then I talk about students, talk about administrators. So first of all, teachers. I feel that uh, seating arrangements is sometimes very important. Usually when you walk into the class, you know Chinese students sit together. Okay? They feel safe, confident, to be with others because whenever they have questions, they can ask me in Chinese. And the professor will not understand what they're talking about. They can text messages to each other easily. Okay. And that kind of uh, dynamic, that kind of phenomenon is happening, uh, as you are aware. So as professors, you will find ways to rotate and try to ask them. Sit with uh, someone who does not speak your first language. Okay, then what, what about too many Chinese students? Sit with someone at least in a group, one of them does not speak your name. Right? <laughs> so you can always find a way to alternate and to have kind of, it's easy. And then students will naturally understand they are encouraged to communicate with people in English or with uh, other languages if they, if they speak that way. Seating arrangement is always important, especially uh, in language uh, classes sometimes, you know, you, they really cannot speak uh, Chinese or other languages. Grouping is also very important. We talk about group, uh, and, and, and I, I wrote a book on grouping. I feel it depends on how you group people. 
what specific assignments you give to each group member, how to take turns, what is the optimal size of groups. So these are all the uh, details, but it's very important. Sometimes the group, they will just find their own buddies to sit together and chat, and then don't do not complete your assignment, or they just spend three minutes, write an answer and chat on their own stuff. So grouping is a very important, you have to be purposeful, you have to be specific, you have to have a way to feedback what they discuss. Design of class activities, structure of this discussion is very important, as you know Chinese students need very uh, concrete objectives, assignments of what they need to do. So when you give them uh, activities, you have, to let, you have to share with them your specific expectations. What do you expect them to do? Rather than, oh, you discuss in five minutes, and they are so happy, oh, well, they have five minutes free time. <laughs> so uh, specific uh, is very important. Psychological approach, we need to alter, need to change, need to be mindful where our students are coming from. And as professors, you can always try Try different ways to see what approach might work better, but they stay with your comfort zone. This is the way I teach. Allow wait time to answer questions. Call out silent students first. Discourage a few individuals dominant discussion. Make participation part of the postcard. And I found them very helpful. And positive reinforcement is always For American peers, be a good listener. Sometimes you will try to understand what your peers, Chinese or other internationals, are saying. Take the initiative to start a conversation. They need someone to warm up, they feel more comfortable. Build a cross cultural friendship, just like a Dallas or early experience in college, very important. And then collaborate with international students in projects, doing projects. I'm a very brief here, I'm, I'm aware of the time. For so other administrators, people like me, or like many of you sitting here, so what can we do? First of all, I would encourage American students to study abroad. That is going to play a major role when they return. They will have empathy, they will understand, they will be eager to help out, reach out to help. If American students do not have that experience, it's very hard to ask them to imagine what they should do or to do what, they, what we feel they can do. So in current local students study abroad, we call the reciprocal, uh, reciprocity is very important. The more students study abroad, when they return, they will help international students in a different way. Because they know how challenging it is when they first arrive in China without speaking any Chinese. And having forced to use chopsticks with a bowl of peanuts in front of them. <laughs> what can they do? And they have done, I'm sorry, they cannot use fingers, right? They lose their face. So I would say that if they experience the challenges our international students have faced, they will really be uh, buddies or advocates and encouragers to all international students to feel comfortable. And that's why we need to add another dimension. For all students studying abroad, they need to reciprocate, you know, the service or the help they receive by volunteering their time to mingle with international students' activities. So that is one recommendation. Second, host more multicultural activities and events on campus. At Stony Brook University, we have more than 16 student associations. Some of them are more active than others, and sometimes it is very important for our students work with their group and reach out to other groups. And I think it takes some organization and incentives for them to feel they actually live in a multicultural uh, campus. Organize more specific orientation programs and workshops for both faculty and students. I know our orientation people are very work uh, very hard and the pre-orientation certainly uh, is, is very beneficial if we can do that. It requires resources. But I would say orientation for faculty, like Agnes, uh, very good. Uh, in your case, MIC, I think you, I, I, uh, Jeff Wang is going to talk about 
Rutgers strategies, one of their strategies really to run constant workshops for faculty in different majors. They based upon the, the, the different uh, uh, you know the areas. I think they have been very helpful. We will encourage those good those faculty who already have good strategies to share with their peers rather than we tell them what to do. And I think that will be more helpful. Provide more support to international student associations. We have some international student associations, Chinese association representatives here. That is very important. And establish one shop service for international student success. That is what I mentioned earlier on at Sonnenberg University. Now we have a task force. We focus on four, more than 35 people from so many units, departments come together from advising, from recruitment, from admission, from orientation, from career center, from colleges, from departments, from global affairs, from visa immigration office. We all come together and then we look at the issues, challenges. And we roughly have four subgroups. One is our international student services, starting from visa, housing, dining, and all these areas. One group is focused on language enhancement, intensive English program, ESL program, academic writing, writing center. We should all come together to see what we can do. One is focusing on academic integrity and try to see how, what can do we do in, in the classrooms, what courses we should offer, how we can innovate our curriculum, etc. And the last one is on. What is your group? I think recruitment and uh, Yes, and I would say that. So, so Ken, what is the last group I forgot? Oh, I'm trying to think. Recruitment. Recruitment. Recruitment and admission. Yes, that, that's student services, academic integrity, and the last one. <laughs> Classroom interaction. Classroom interaction. We really need to focus on the intercultural communication and classroom interaction, classroom dynamics, etc. So these are the four areas that the Sonnenberg University is a gathering of our talent, discuss, debate, come up with the recommendations, and eventually we have to implement some of the high-level recommendations. So this is a, a, to us is our effort to help students succeed, and one of them is to help them mingle, acculturate themselves, and try to break silence, change the stereotypical stereotypes. Last but not least, I have two more minutes. <laughs> For institutions, establish one shop, one stop service, that's what I talked about, and then we need to focus on everything beyond the recruitment. But we need to also start with from recruitment. And I think the last is thank you. No. All right, so this is a fun. I think I want to show you. So when we say far beyond recruitment, what do we mean? This is what I mean. We need to start with branding. Who we are at the university. Marketing, recruitment, admission, visa and immigration services, enrollment, orientation, academic advising, Counseling, English enhancement, academic writing, writing center, co-curricular activities, international student associations, career center, internship and OPT opportunities. Do you think we have more? I think there is space. <laughs> Global housing. Graduation, I think. Okay. Foundation. Post family programs. And anything beyond that is within your imagination. <laughs> so I want to say that this will, this continuum will always be on and on. Sometimes not necessarily in this linear fashion. They all happen at the same time. So if we can all work together, and I, I believe we can have a robust model to really help not only recruit better students in the future, but also provide better service to enable them to succeed. 
then I have to use thank you. Thank you.